Thrive Friends, this is your host, Dr. Solomon. Have you ever wondered how to cultivate a limitless mindset? Today I'm joined by a truly special guest who will help us answer this question. I won't say her name. I just have to say how she starts her conversation, her own podcast. I'll quote her here. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Hey LGO. We will have big talk. Why big talk? Because she hates small talk. My guest today is the one and only Laura Gastner Otting, aka LGO. What a pleasure to have you, Laura. Oh, it is so great to be here, Dr. Solomon. I'm really excited to get in some big talk today. I know you hate small talk. Why do you hate small talk, Laura? I don't know. I feel like, you know, we've all got this one big juicy life on earth and why do we want to waste it talking about the weather? Let's talk about real stuff. I mean, every one of us is in this place right now where we're, we're privileged enough to be safe at home. And when somebody says, how are you? They actually mean it. I fully agree with you. It's one of the silver linings. We start to see more genuine caring. Before I go to the first question, I'd like to give a small intro about LGO. She is number two startup coach globally and number 10 motivation speaker globally in 2020. She was also a TEDx speaker. She is a best-selling author. She is a host of a podcast and a show. She is a lot of things. So she is a true source of knowledge and it's a true privilege to have her with me today. Let's start with your book, Laura. Limitless, how to ignore everybody, carve your own path and live your best life. I genuinely valued your push for a limitless mindset and living a meaningful life. But here's the issue. You advocate that, quote, the world is limited. This doesn't mean you can't be limitless. How to cultivate this mindset when, for example, we have limited control over situations, say a job layoff or no job offer despite many interviews or limited job market? What's your take on this? So I think that one of the things that we all said during this pandemic was, I'm so limited right now. My world is so limited. My physical world is so limited. I can't do certain things. But the truth is, is that our worlds are always limited by things that are outside of our control, whether it's, you know, not being able to apply for a certain job or change because you've got debt that you need to pay off or you haven't finished a degree yet, or maybe you've gone on lots of interviews and you can't quite, you know, crack the code on why you haven't gotten the job offer. There have always been things that are outside of our control, but the one thing that is inside of our control is how we prepare for those times. So I read something a long time ago, which really stuck with me, which was, don't be the person who wants to find the girlfriend or boyfriend. Don't be the person who wants to get the promotion. Don't be the person who wants to get the raise. Become the person who deserves it, right? Become the person who is better so that those things come to you. Become, if you want a boyfriend or a girlfriend, become a more interesting person. If you want the promotion or the raise, get better at the work that you're doing. Learn more, build your network. So there are things that we can do right now even if you cannot right now on this day go apply for another job, there are things that you can do right now to put you in a place where when the world opens back up, in fact, you can go do those things. So I joke around that I've got, um, I've got teenage boys and so there's a lot of video games that are played in my house. And there was one morning where I woke up a couple of years ago and I was like, you know, moaning about how I just, I got a bad night of sleep. I wasn't going to be able to write the next chapter that I had due. I was really frustrated. And my, my older son turned to me and he was like, well, just go on a side quest. I was like, oh, what's a side quest? And he goes, you know, like if the main quest is to go to the castle and slay the dragon and save the princess, but you can't go because, you know, you finished doing dishes, but your friend who you're playing the game with hasn't yet finished doing dishes. So he hasn't logged onto his computer. There are things that you can do. You're not ready to go on the main quest, but you can go on the side quest. So what does that mean? That means you're a farmer. So you can uh, till your wheat. You can take it to the market. You can sell it with the money from your wheat. You can get a horse and a sword and some potions so that when your friend finally does log on, you can get on your horses. You can go to the castle. You can slay the dragon. You can save the princess. 
So if you are feeling right now, like you're frustrated because of things that are outside of your control, whether it's that you've gone on a lot of interviews or you're, you know, you can't apply right now because of the pandemic and you can't, you know, go do certain things. There are things you can do. You can build your network. You can learn another language. You can watch TED Talks. You can read more books. You can practice, you know, uh, 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 you know, more Zoom interviews. You can get back in touch with your references to make sure that they're saying the things that you need them to be saying. There's all kinds of things that you can do right now everything's in your control as long as you figure out what it is to work on because we've all got plenty to work on and i couldn't agree more with you if anything it could be an opportunity for us to catch up and do things that we always wanted to do but we never had time for and that leads me to next question and I, again i will quote you from your book when when life goes back to normal Will the normal I go back to be the life I even want? Close the quote. So six to 12 months from now, we might be in the post-pandemic time and adapting to a new norm, whatever that norm will be, uh, but seems it will be different from the pre-pandemic time. Any suggestions on how to build a post-pandemic limitless mindset now so that we can be ready when the tough times are over? One of the things that is at the center of my book, Limitless, How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path, and Live Your Best Life, is that first part of the subtitle, How to Ignore Everybody. And I think what happens is that we're all living this life that's normal because normal means it's the same thing that everybody else is doing, right? Yes. And I've always been a lifelong entrepreneur. Like I don't accept the new normal because Dr. Solomon, frankly, I never accepted the old normal. <laughs> I was not okay with the way that like my boss in the traditional office with the traditional, uh, you know, rules. I, I wasn't okay with that. So I started my own business. I wasn't okay with, with the way that everybody told me I had to be. So I've always done my own thing. And you know, my, my friend Scott Stratton likes to say that uh, entrepreneur is uh, Latin for bad employee. And I think that's probably pretty true. I actually ran into a former boss of mine once uh, I'm walking down the street and he was like, did you always know you were an entrepreneur? Because I always knew you were an entrepreneur. And I was like, oh, wow, awesome. <laughs> and then I walked down the street and later I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I think that was an insult. <laughs> oh, <Exactly sure. laughs> I'm a bad employee. But you know, I think that what I would say to people who were asking themselves this question, when life goes back to normal, is the normal I'm going back to or the life I want, is to think about what they're looking for in their life. What causes them joy? What makes them happy? What do you enjoy to do? Uh, you know, how can you get paid for the work that you love? That's the holy grail. We all want to get there. But what are you looking for? Are you interested in, you know, the big car, the big promotion, the big raise? Maybe you're interested in spending more time with your family. Maybe you're interested in, in traveling around the world. When I ran my last business, I used to say that we could maximize for profit. We could maximize for personal freedom and flexibility, or we could maximize for impact in the world. It was very hard to maximize for all three. So we would make decisions based on one, or two of those three as our guiding principles. And I'll tell you what happened is that the third one always followed. So when we made decisions based on impact in the world and personal freedom and flexibility, which were the two reasons I wanted to be in business for myself, it turns out we actually all made more money than we made doing the same work for the traditional, you know, big brick and mortar office that we'd all been at before. So as you're thinking about when life goes back to normal, think about those questions. Why am I doing this work? What am I maximizing for? And is the work I'm doing actually allowing me to do that? The idea of we have to choose or compromise between the three and then the third one will follow is at the center of this because I assume all of us think we can do all three and all three effectively. Right, so for me, like, obviously I wanted to make profit, right? I wanted to yes. maximize for impact in the world. I wanted to maximize for my personal flexibility and freedom. Like I want to do good work with good people who are doing good things. But I also wanted to go to my kid's soccer game at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday. Like I didn't want to miss my kids growing up. In terms of profit, the reason we didn't maximize for profit is that I had two numbers in mind. I had the need to make number and the want to make number. So the need to make number was like, what do I need to make? 
How much does my mortgage cost? What are groceries cost? What kinds of vacations do I want to go on? What is college going to cost for my kids? And then there was the want to make number, which is like when I go on those vacations, am I staying at the Holiday Inn or the Four Seasons, right? So there's two different numbers. And so I didn't have to maximize always for the top number because I knew what I needed to make for the bottom number. And as long as I was at that number, everything else above that was gravy. And it turns out that when you do work that is actually values driven for the things that you actually care about, then the third one of those always follows. Sometimes it lags behind a couple of years, right? So, you know, if you're maximizing for profit, and impact, but you're not maximizing for personal flexibility. Maybe you make a ton of money, you work 24 seven and you retire early. So you get the, the, the freedom flexibility at some other point. You don't get it at the same time, but right, you, you gotta figure out when you want each of the things. So for me, those were the things that I cared about. Other people, you know, your mileage may vary, but for me, those were the things that I cared about. And when I was really in my zone and I was leading in that sort of values driven way, it all made sense. It all worked. And I was able to do more of my best work. Thank you for sharing this, Laura. And I noticed myself naturally calling you Laura rather than LGO. For me, it's the maybe the personal connection with you, Laura. Uh, and LGO is the still the great brand. Stage persona. You. Yeah. 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 And although I have to say, you don't have a stage persona, Laura. You are one and the same. You don't like small it's talk. It's true. Before we move on, I'd like to ask people watching us to open a new tab and look up heylgo, H-E-Y, lgo.com to know more about Laura, her work, her expertise, and also check her blog. She has a wonderful, wonderful blog, and she is very active on it. You can also check her social media on the same account, heylgo, H-E-Y, L-G-O, all Twitter. Instagram, Facebook, that makes it easy for everyone. Now- I'm everywhere. Uh, I know, <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> I am one of the same everywhere I am, it's true. It is, and it's, it's something that's really admirable, Laura. In Thank your you. book, you talk about the four C's, calling, connection, contribution, control. I'm curious why it shows these four factors compared say to the social media anthem of passion and purpose and happiness and balance and all these lovely things. Any reason? Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I, I think that passion, purpose, happiness, and balance are like the four horsemen of the success apocalypse. They just trot in innocently enough with these messages of like bigger, better, faster, more, and they make us miserable, right? passion or let's 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 start with purpose purpose is this idea that if you're not literally giving the shirt off your back to poor kids in needs clearly your work has no purpose whatsoever right like it's not service if it's not sacrifice and if it's not sacrifice you're just a pay, pencil pusher and i just I, that's just not true right like everybody can have a purpose your purpose might be curing cancer your purpose might be helping kids in need, but your purpose also might be working at a hedge fund and making tons of money so that you can donate some of that to people that are trying to cure cancer or help kids in need. Your purpose might be working at a job where you're financially secure so that your kids can make choices you didn't get to make. And your purpose might just be buying a Maserati in a beach house just for you. And that's okay. Like your purpose is your purpose and nobody else gets a vote about your purpose but you. But the problem is that we give votes in our lives to people who shouldn't even have voices. And then we end up like chasing somebody's normal. And then there's um, balance and balance is like there's work and there's life and God forbid you do a little bit more of one or the other and you're not in balance. But you know, you just listed all of my social media handles. We all are living on social media. We're all living out loud. So there's already no line between work and life. Like I think right now it's not about looking for work-life balance, but work-life alignment because they have to they have to work together like i don't think people are exhausted because they're busy i think they're exhausted because they're so busy code switching back and forth between the costumes they're wearing at work and at life but if you're doing work that's integrated and aligned it's so much better and then there's happiness and i think the four worst words in the english language are i'll be happy when I'll be happy when I get the raise. I'll be happy when I get promoted. I'll be happy when I get the job. I'll be happy when I get married. I'll be happy when I get divorced. But I'll be happy when, and I don't know, like, don't you want to be happy now? 
Like this all be happy when mantra that we see on social media tells us that we're like one uh, promotion, one gift, one new purchase, one car, one title, whatever, away from finally being happy. And it just keeps moving the goalposts further on. And it doesn't allow us to just have joy in our lives right now. And then there's my favorite, which is passion, which is this like, you've seen her, the like perfectly flaxen haired beauty wearing her boho chic. And she's like staring at over the sunset or like Coachella, remember concerts, like that kind of stuff. And she's saying, she's like imploring us to like follow your passion as if all you have to do is follow your passion and suddenly everything will be fine. And what that does is it sets us all up to be miserable because the minute something gets hard, the minute we make a mistake, the minute we fail, we say, oh, I guess it must not be my passion. I'll drop it and keep looking. And the truth is like your passion is gonna kick the crap out of you before you get it right, right? It's like the falling down and the getting up and the falling down and the getting up that actually teaches you that it's your passion because you wanna keep working at it. So like, doesn't your passion deserve more than you just following it, but actually investing in it and getting better? So those four things, I think they set us up for failure all the time. They, they, they want us to like follow the Joneses, to compete with the Joneses, to keep up with the Joneses. I say, screw the Joneses. Like let's not, let's figure out what happiness is for us. Let's figure out what joy is for us. Let's figure out what fulfillment is for us and go after that. And so in 20 years of doing executive search, I interviewed thousands of people who were at the top of their game. Like I was hired by my clients to call the most successful people old face names who were doing great things. That's why I was calling them. They had all this success. And despite that, they were returning my calls because even though they had all this success, they weren't very happy. And I found that fascinating. And I started to notice that the people who had both success and happiness had a handful of things that I came to know to be consonants, which is the cornerstone of my book, Limitless. And consonants is alignment it's flow. It's when the best of what you do is being called upon to solve a problem that you actually care about. And the, in the solving of that problem, you get rewarded in some way, whether it's financial or emotional or karmic, that is interesting to you. And the people who were able to do that had four things, and that's what they had. They had calling, connection, contribution, and control. And so in the book, I go into each of the four of these and what they mean and how I found that everyone at every different age and life stage had calling, connection, contribution, and control different. And I'll just give a quick sentence on each of the four, and then we can we can dive deeper or move on to the, to, to the right. next thing if you want. So calling. Calling is, it's, it's not your purpose, right? Writ large. Like we get it wrong because we think purpose has to be like higher or lofty, but calling really is that gravitational force. It's the thing that gets you out of bed. It's a business you want to build, a family you want to nurture, a cause that you want to serve, a leader who inspires you. It's the, it's the thing that excites you. And it's, it only has to be the thing for now. Like it doesn't have to be the thing for your entire life. Like we all have different callings at different times. Connection. Connection answers the question, whether or not your work matters. If you called in sick to work tomorrow, would anybody notice? Would anybody care? Does the work you're doing on a daily basis connect to that calling that you just identified? Three, contribution. If connection is all about the work, contribution is really all about you. Your work should contribute something to your life, but what? Does it give you the money that you want to live the lifestyle that you'd like to have? Does it give you the career trajectory that your ambition you know, would, would like to see? Does it allow you to manifest your values on a daily basis? What does the work you're doing contribute to your life? And then last is control. And control really allows you to understand you know, whether or not you have personal agency mm -hmm. to um, determine how much connection your work has to that calling or how much it's going to contribute to your life. And each one of us at every different age and every different life stage is going to want each of these four in different amounts. And the people that I saw of the thousands that I interviewed who had both success and happiness had this kind of own personal definition of consonants that worked for them and they were living into it fully. I loved your straight answer to the point.
That's it. This is Laura. She will Good not talk. sugarcoat it. Yes. And I, I can't agree more with you, Laura. The idea of pursuing happiness as a goal rather than almost a byproduct of what we do is becoming a new mantra. And it is opposite to what the ancient philosophers said. Happiness should not be a goal. And yeah. Anything. Because it's ephemeral. Exactly. It, it, it doesn't last. It doesn't last. Like we, we can pursue happiness, but often by the time we get to the end goal, our definition of happiness has changed. That's really tough. Speaking of this, Laura, <laughs> we talk about happiness and the importance of having some trials in life. This is the question I ask every guest on Thrive. We all had setbacks where we picked ourselves up and managed to. Mm -hmm. Would you mind sharing one of yours and how did you overcome it? Yeah, so I talked earlier about um, how I used to make decisions when I ran my company based on whether or not we wanted to maximize profit, impact, or personal flexibility and freedom. Mm -hmm. And five years ago, I. Um, decided I wanted, well, 10 years ago, I decided I want to sell my company to the women who helped me build it. And it took about five years to go through the exit strategy of that firm. And it, it, it was slower than I wanted for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons was that it took a very long time to figure out the value of the firm. So like, you know, what I get paid, right, for, for building the firm and for my exit. And we did the typical valuation process of the firm and we came up with the number. And my business partner looked at me and she's like, we don't have that kind of cash. Like we, we can't, we can't pay you that. So we're not going to. And um, we could, maybe we'll just shut down the business. Maybe we'll just um, start another one. Um, sorry, we don't have it. And I got really upset about that because I had spent everything I've ever created I'm proud to say still exists. Like I've done a lot of hard work in my life to build institutions and not cathedrals, right? And that's a really important distinction, right? You can build an institution that's going to outlive you or a cathedral that's just in honor of you that just will disappear once you're gone. And it was really important to me and everything I've done to build an institution. And I was really upset about the fact that because they couldn't pay me, I, it wasn't going to exist beyond me. And then my husband who was far smarter than I am. And I will say to anybody, marry somebody, you know, husband, wife, whoever, who is smarter than you, it is the best decision you'll ever make. And he said to me, he's like, Lori, he's like, I don't understand. Why are you getting so caught up on the valuation number? You never ran the company for maximum profit. Why are you trying to sell it for maximum profit? I was like, oh, right. But I think a lot of times I was able to make decisions for the business that put impact in the world and personal freedom and flexibility first. But when it came for myself and my ego got all wrapped up in it, that was really difficult. And so I called my business partner that afternoon and I was like, listen, how about this? I'll sell you the firm for a dollar. I'll sell you the firm for a dollar plus a percentage of um, revenue for the following five years. As long as you show a dollar of profit I'm going to get a percentage of revenue for the next five years, which is about as far back as I can cast a shadow, right? After five years, their success is their success. It has nothing to do with me anymore. So because I spent some time thinking if I weren't selling this for maximum profit, but I were selling it for maximum impact, right? I wanted to keep, continue and maximum freedom and flexibility. I want to get out. I wanted to go and be able to do something else. Then how would I sell it? And that was what we came up with. And here's the thing. I sold it to maximize impact and to maximize personal freedom and flexibility. And it turns out five years later, I actually made more money in the payout over the course of five years than I would have if they would have paid me that initial number in the beginning. So as I said, you make decisions based on two of the factors. The third one always follows. What a story, Laura. What a story. It was quite a setback though. I spent a number of nights very upset, crying, frustrated. I felt insulted. I felt demeaned. I felt underappreciated. And had I not had that conversation that really like righted me, righted the ship back to what I actually cared about, the whole thing probably would have blown up and it wouldn't exist today. 
It's about so the, the lesson mind. here, right? Is surround yourself with good people. That's absolutely true. And also the mindset. It took yeah. just one conversation to change the focus from the profit. Yes. Now, what's interesting about it is that my husband runs his business to maximize profitability. So he, I surrounded myself with good people, but good people who reminded me of who I am, not who they are, not what's important to them, right? Ignore everyone, carve your own path and live your best life. Limitless. I, I surrounded myself with people who reminded me who I am. And I think if you live fully into who you are as the person, and that's what brings out your very best, that's, that's, he allowed me to sell the firm with consonants, as opposed to just selling it with like good business marketability. What can I say? It's, it's such a story, such a story. Before we move on to the next question, I'd like to remind people watching us now to check Laura's social media and why not follow me on my social media at dr solomon md and please subscribe to this youtube channel and share the episode with other people who might benefit from it now this is my last question for you and to any guests i have on the show anything you would like to share with your audience on thrive that you haven't shared before on a podcast oh well this is like brand new <laughs> uh <laughs> so speaking of surrounding yourself with good people um, my dear friend Rahaf Harfouch and I have been talking every Monday morning for a year, almost the entire mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, and just as an accountability club, just the two of us, like, what are you working on? Where are you going? How's it going? What are you reading? What's new? Just quirky ideas, um, trying new things, productivity hacks, um, uh, figuring out like wacky things about like the BTS army and Taylor Swift and how they relate to going viral and, you know, the vaccine and all kinds of like things that you would never expect. And it's become a little bit of like a uh, salon meets best cocktail party conversation you've ever had meets uh, mastermind meets Harvard Business School. And we're actually going to launch it into an annual subscription uh, we're calling it the Forge Society because Forge there's Society. nothing stronger than something that's come through fire. So we're going to launch that the beginning of 2021 and we're accepting applications starting now. So if people are interested in finding it, they can go to the Forge Society.us. Check the us Forge out. Society.us. I'm sure it will be all big talk. All First big talk. time I've announced it to anybody anywhere, but it's going to be big uh we're going to limit participation we're going to um we're going to screen applications so that you know we're very clear on the kind of people that we want in there we're very clear about the kinds of people we don't we have a um we have a no a-hole policy so you know we want to make sure that people have a good time they get heard they feel safe and they um, are able to create systems and structures and hacks that work for them so that they can be the very best version of themselves that they want to be. I'd love to know more about your no a-hole policy. What is this policy, Laura? I am so sick and tired of these just douchey guys, excuse my French, but that's just who they are, <laughs> who like scream from their rented Maserati, like, hustle, you rise and grind, baby. And I'm just like, they're telling you how to do things that they've never done. And and I was saying to Rahaf, who, who wrote the book, um, uh, Hustle and Float, which is amazing. It's basically all about how there's times to hustle and like work really hard and, you know, and, and, and get the work done. And there's times to float. And when you float, that's when the real creativity happens. She did a deep dive on people like Beyonce and Taylor Swift and Steve Jobs and, and, and just anyone you've ever like looked up to as like an incredible creative force. And she figured out how they're able to be so prolific. And so the book is called Hustle and Float and it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. She, um, she and I had this ongoing annoyance about these kinds of dudes. And I said, I want to get t-shirts printed that say something like, before you tell me what to do, tell me what, show me what you've done. And on the back of it, it's like hashtag, show me your PNL, right? Because you have these, these, these mastermind gurus who they've actually never built a business. 
they don't really know what it's like to walk in the shoes of the people that they're masterminding. And so we just decided we don't want any of those people in here. We don't want any of those people that are like all about the cliche and the BS and the nonsense. And and I need to tell you, I'm working really hard not to curse right now because I feel very, very passionate about, about these individuals. And I just, they're the ones who are like passion, purpose, happiness, balance. And they're just, they're just, they're, they're the ones who trotted on those horsemen that I talked about earlier. They just, they just make you feel bad. And, you know, most of the self-help industry is actually not built to try to help you. Most of the self-help industry is, is built to actually make you feel worse after you've read the book than before you started because then they sell you the next book and I was actually just pulling up a, a, a copy of the paperback right here because there's a, um, a a quote from Jordan Harbinger you know renowned podcaster Jordan Harbinger on the back and his quote is in a sea of soul-sucking self-help garbage limitless busts through the Instagrammable memes masquerading as inspiration it draws a roadmap of actionable steps so that you can find not just success but fulfillment as well and that's it it's like there's so much soul-sucking garbage in the self-help space and in the mastermind space and in the guru space and we just decided let's actually do one that's not like here's the system but actually here are 17 different types of systems we've studied them all if you're a morning person and a creative you might like this one if you're an evening person who's a systems person you might like this one right and just help people to figure out how to build systems that actually work for them so it's totally outside of limitless it's totally outside of my limitless course and my you know big talk podcast that i'm you know using as 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 research for running the next book and all the stuff that i do within the limitless world but it's going to be super fun and i'm as you can tell i'm really excited about it i could absolutely tell your passion <laughs> about this so please people watching this episode go and check the forge society.us not .com is that correct Laura? It's dot us um, because dot com was already taken. Nothing's there. Maybe we'll buy it at some point. But right now, you know, I think that it is so much fun to be like nine toes over the edge of incompetence and just figure out what's out there. Right. None of us know what we're doing. We're all making it up as we go along. And everybody feels like an imposter because if you get to the rung that's higher than the rung you thought you'd get to. Of course, you don't feel like you belong there, but neither does anyone else. And we're all so busy clinging to this that we're so afraid to 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 experiment. So, right now, we're experimenting with the Forge Society .us, and if it turns out it's got legs and it's a thing, maybe we'll you know pay up for the .com. But right now, we just want a whole bunch of other you know merry merry wanderers on our journey with us. Best of luck with this new endeavor. I don't know how many hours you have in the day, Laura, to do all this, but they are definitely <laughs> not twenty-four. And I can speak with you for days, Laura, and I hope we have a chance to have you again as a special guest on Thrive. I'd love that. So people, if you're enjoying the conversation I'm having now with Laura, aka LGO, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, comment on the video. Remember to check Hey LGO, H-E-Y-L-G-O, social media and our website where you will find links to her book and also her latest wonderful blogs. Until we meet next time, keep safe, keep motivated, keep resilient, and see you in the next episode of Thrive. Thank you.